stars above they twinkle they put on quite a show you know the light that meets our eyes today left a million years ago tells us quite a story and strands of DNA Saint Spark at birth the universe is born in us today and they're already on their way already on their way thanks for unknown blessings already on their way already already on their way now this world is a fun house mirror sometimes you feel just like a clown sometimes everything's distorted a little upside down and the truth it just gets twisted like a rope that's torn and freed you feel like you can't go on no more it just might slip away but they're already on their way already on their way thanks for unknown blessings already on their way history's a spiral sometimes it's hard to see through the smoke and the blood and the tear gas there's a path of victory it's a crooked road we walk on but strung with miracles along the way like raindrops to the ocean We'll make it there someday. And we're already on our way. Already on our way. Thanks for unknown blessings. Already on. already on their way wow thank you so much steve and your accompanist what a beautiful message for us today um i noticed that um, a lot of you guys were commenting and on the chat so ditto well um welcome i'm meredith patterson i'll be your uh host and pianist today and you are joining uh the unitarian universalist of new braunfels one of our virtual services and we welcome everyone uh no exceptions we're just glad that that you're here and and hope that you're healthy 
So I'm going to light my chalice, my, my candle today, and I do so in the spirit of healing, love, connection, and to blessings on their way, as, as Steve so eloquently sang. Um, our special guest, you have probably seen before, if you've been a part of our uh, of our group or attended other services, it's Mr. Steve Brooks. And Steve is a, a lot of things. He's a true Renaissance man. He's a musician, a composer, a poet. He's a journalist. He's a pun master. Uh, now living in Austin, Steve is a frequent presenter to UU churches here in Texas and across the country. And in fact, Steve was uh, our featured speaker at the very first Zoom service that we did last spring, all those long, long months ago. Uh, he's written many songs recorded by other artists, including Slade Cleves, Albert Engage, and for the actor Russell Crowe. And now he is part of the legendary 60s trio, The Limelighters. You are in for a treat today, and we look forward to more of Steve's music and his words. Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. Passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever before you learn the tender gravity of kindness. You must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it's only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is you I have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. <laughs> a time shaking hands was a welcoming sign but now a hug could be passing a nasty but we must embrace the concept of staying in place not playing it safe could be such a blunder I'd rather be six feet apart six Apart. I'd rather be six feet apart than six feet under. Take my advice. Friends don't let friends go risking their lives. Don't get too close. I'd hate to give you a lethal dose. Just smile and wave. And think of the people we'll save from early graves and eternal slumber. I'd rather be six feet apart, six feet apart. I'd rather be six feet apart, six feet under. From a distance, we all can reach out and touch someone. Here's the difference, let's do it smart. Not do it dumb, dumb, dumb. Let's learn the art of 
a band together while being apart meet face to face. Only do it in cyberspace. It's strange, it's true. But it beats going to the ICU. It's easy to do. You got my number. And I'd rather be six feet apart. Six feet apart. I'd rather be six feet apart. Than six feet under. I'd rather be six feet apart. Step away from the shopping cart. Rather be six feet apart than six feet under. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be back with you uh, virtually from uh, my bunker uh, here somewhere in South Austin to uh, y'all there in New Braunfels. Um, that song I just played for you, by the way, uh, you can find on uh, YouTube. I recorded it with my band, uh, The Limelighters. We made a video over the summer, and if you look up six feet apart, uh, you can see the song and uh, share it. It's, it's been viewed by uh, more than 20,000 people last we checked. A deadly microbe jumps from animals to humans. Authorities run through every stage of denial before they lock down an entire city. Medical supplies are short, hospitals are overloaded, and death rates skyrocket. Victims die alone while the living ail from anxiety and isolation. If this description sounds like it's ripped from today's headlines, think again. It is the city of Oran in Algeria. Oran is a real city, but in the 1948 novel, The Plague, by the French writer and philosopher Albert Camus, it suffers a fictional outbreak of bubonic plague. Seven decades later, we're living in the middle of an actual plague, but it feels like we've been dropped into a piece of fiction. We don't know the ending. What we do know is that everything we've ever counted on is suddenly uncertain. We're not sure how we will protect our health or pay our bills. Our ultimate uncertainties are how long we will be, we will be marooned in this malignant land of Oz and whether there will be a normal to return to. We're fighting a biological virus, but as I check my emotional temperature, I notice that I'm fighting a spiritual one as well. Its symptoms include fear, anger, and despair. It's highly contagious, and unlike the organism, it doesn't require physical contact. When I talk with friends these days, we chat about how to strengthen our spiritual immune systems. For some, it's prayer or meditation. For others, it's walking or baking bread. It can be artistic expressions like painting pictures or playing music. One way that I've been doing it lately is by revisiting some classic works of literature. I'd like to believe that our current predicament is an interruption of ordinary life. Books remind me that it's not. As Camus puts it, there have been as many plagues as wars in history. Yet always, plagues and wars catch people equally by surprise. Literature helps me understand my situation, not just in my mind, but in my imagination. History book tells me what happened. A novel tells me how it felt. It opens a sort of time tunnel, if you will, a sort of Zoom meeting. I converse with others from other times, about the physical challenges and the ethical dilemmas that we share. They can teach me how they coped. And even more important, they can show me how they made sense of it all. To me, one of the strongest antidotes to a spiritual virus is the activity of seeking meaning. Viktor Frankl, psychotherapist and former prisoner of Auschwitz, maintained that a common trait of survivors 
was the ability to hold on to a higher purpose. He wrote, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. He summed it up, the meaning of life is to give life meaning. This morning, I would like to talk about two great works of imagination that do just that. They explore the meaning of sudden and unexpected suffering. They are separated by at least 2,500 years, but they both seem to be part of the same conversation. They are the plague and the Old Testament tale, the book of Job. I will start with the older of the two books. It is one that has fascinated me for decades. It's partly for its vivid poetry. It's also because it seems remarkably modern, a portrait of a fragile human being who confronts an uncaring universe. But it debates an eternal question. Why do bad things happen to good people? The good person is Job. He's the wealthiest man in the land of Uz. He is also God-fearing to the point of obsessive compulsive. When his kids throw a party, he sacrifices a beast to atone for whatever sins they might have committed. Ironically, his piety is what gets him into trouble. One day, God and Satan are talking. Back when heaven is young and Satan is still one of the angels. God starts bragging about his servant Job. And Satan, playing the part of the troll, slyly plants a seed of doubt. Take away Job's wealth, his health, and his children, he says, and Job will begin to curse his maker. God takes up the wager. He allows Satan to inflict every kind of torment on the hapless Job. Whirlwinds, earthquakes, leprosy, you name it. So what does this peculiar prologue tell us besides the notion that God can't be trusted? In ancient Hebrew, the word Satan means adversary. When sudden misfortune strikes, it often feels like an adversary. Life is going along swimmingly, and then out of the blue, my sense of security is shattered. It may be an accident, a layoff, a diagnosis or a death. It could be a pandemic. Whatever the details, it is so far outside of my everyday experience that until it happens to me, I don't know how I will react. As for Job, he endures the first attacks of the adversary with surprising poise. Eventually, however, he cracks. Is there anyone in the year 2021 who has not felt these words? My sighing comes in place of my food, and my groanings flow forth like water. I have no ease. I have no quietness. I cannot rest. As Job is bemoaning his bad luck, three so-called friends arrive. They come to comfort him, but instead they lecture him. God must be punishing him for something he's done. Whatever it was, he needs to figure it out and repent. The more that they badger him, however, the more that Job maintains his innocence. He finally issues a challenge directly to God. Explain why he is guilty, because he hasn't got a clue. As I read their speeches, it seems to me that both Job and his accusers are getting it wrong. They believe in a simplistic moral universe in which good deeds get rewarded and bad deeds get punished. In the real world, it doesn't always work out that way. These days, a lot of us feel just like Job, as a powerless pawn in some kind of cosmic game. At last, a young man speaks up. He guesses what's really going on. Job is not being punished. He's being tested. What is Job really made of? It's easy to do good 
when prosperity is smiling on him. But how will he behave when there's no hope of reward? It's a question that resonates with me here in what I call the Corona Apocalypse. The adversary seems to be testing us on many levels. As an individual, it tests my responsibility. As a community, it asks what limits we will accept for our common good. As a nation, it questions whether our democracy still works. It's with these questions that our second book might help us. For the moment, let's leave Job in his troubles and swing across the Mediterranean from Ouz to Oran. The plague is about how people act when they're put to the test. There's nothing special or heroic about the citizens of Oran. They could be any of us. Camus writes, its ordinariness is what strikes one first about the town. Their first reaction when rats begin dying in their streets is to cling to their sense of the ordinary. They avoid naming the disease. Well, like the plague. The Black Death was a relic of the Middle Ages. Couldn't possibly happen here in the modern world. A second stage sets in once the entire city is quarantined. Now, its citizens feel like exiles in their own land. They have to figure out a new rules for how to navigate a new, bewildering, and threatening world. As Camus describes it, all these people found themselves, without the least warning, hopelessly cut off. They had been sentenced for an unknown crime to an indeterminate period of punishment. Ironically, they are united by a sense of personal isolation. Camus explains, the ache of separation from those one loves suddenly became a feeling in which all shared alike. Although everyone faces the same threat, they deal with it in very different ways. Some flout the risks of exposure and party their nights away. Some try to escape past sentries on the city walls. Those who can afford it hoard food and supplies, while profiteers make fortunes by selling foods and supplies. Then there are the heroes of Camus' story. They are the frontline essential workers, like doctors and nurses. There are also civilian volunteers who do public health work, like sanitation. From a medical point of view, their work is often futile. They watch helplessly as patient after patient succumbs in gruesome ways. But they're also fighting a spiritual illness, and in that struggle, they find meaning, says one doctor. There's no question of heroism in all this. The only means of writing a plague is common decency. Someone asks, what do you mean by common decency? He replies, I don't know what it means for other people, but in my case, I know that it consists of doing my job. For Camus' original readers, the plague had still another dimension, political. They recognized it as a metaphor for fascism. He wrote much of the novel during the Nazi occupation of France, while he was risking his life in the resistance. Despite the liberation of France, he warns his companions that victory can never be permanent. The urge to political violence lies latent in human societies and in human hearts. We can never let down our guard any more than our personal hygiene. It's a timely message for our present moment in which a biological virus is intertwined with a political one. We have seen in recent months how people who swallow lies about wearing masks go on to swallow lies about white supremacy and about a stolen election. We have seen the resurgence of a homegrown fascism 
as armed mobs threaten the lives of lawmakers and storm the Capitol. Says one central character in the plague, each of us has the plague within him. No one, no one on earth is free from it. But he adds that carrying the plague carries a moral duty to resist it. On this earth, there are pestilences and there are victims, he says, and it is up to us as far as possible not to join forces with the pestilences. One of the few things that's certain about a biological plague is that it won't last forever. In record time, we are developing and deploying vaccines and treatments. Even if we didn't have them, in the worst case scenario, the pathogen would eventually run out of new hosts. With a spiritual plague, however, the ending may not be so clear cut. In both of our stories, the world recovers, but not all of the characters do. The book of Job pretends to have a happy ending. God makes it all up to Job by blessing him with twice the wealth he had before. But God demands a heavy price, utter humiliation. He arrives on the scene in the form of a tornado. He rages at a mere mortal for daring to question him. The creator is not bound by the same rules that he sets for his creation. Job does what most of us would do when we're outgunned. He humbles himself in the dust. The lesson he draws is one of a trauma survivor. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. I'm gonna take a moment to see who has themselves unmuted. I'm hearing background noise. Meredith, maybe you can check. Okay. That seems to have dealt with it. Back in Oran, after nine months of quarantine, deaths decline as abruptly as they had shot up. At last, the gates of the city are thrown open. In echoes of liberated France, people pour into the streets. Here in 2021, we are fervently looking forward to such a moment, although it may not arrive as abruptly as in Oran. One day, we'll have the confidence to go out for something as simple as a restaurant meal. One day, we'll listen to live music again. One day, I'll get to play live music again. Or will we? For some in Iran, the plague will never go away. Camus writes, he knew what those jubilant crowds did not, but could have learned from books, that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good, that it bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves, and that perhaps the day would come when, for the bane and enlightening of men, it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. Those of us who are baby boomers might have seen a similar shadow over our parents and grandparents. Many who came of age during the Great Depression were forever cautious, trusting that bad times were always just around the corner. Those who came home from the Second World War launched an astonishing burst of economic activity, but many of them were haunted by demons of whom they refused to speak. In time, it will be our turn. We long to be normal again, but neither do we want to forget the lessons of the plague, that health is a temporary condition that one of the greatest human luxuries is the luxury of making plans. Which is why, at this moment, still in the midst of the whirlwind, might be a perfect time to be seeking meaning. I can remind myself 
that I am a lot like Job. As old meanings get swept away, I have an opportunity to create newer and wiser ones. I can practice the spiritual balancing acts that I will be needing after the plague. I can make plans for the future. Well, I try not to be attached to when I can carry them out. I can cultivate vigilance for the long haul, knowing that although I am weary of the plague, it is hardly weary of me. I can find new ways to connect with my friends and new avenues to perform my work while I am grieving the old avenues that may be closed for good. I can strive to show compassion to myself and to others, knowing that we are all stretched out and stressed out beyond our limits. Those are some of my meanings. We each have our own meanings to seek. The very work of seeking them, I want to suggest, helps to inoculate against the spiritual virus by defiantly constructing meaning on days that sometimes seem meaningless. I give myself hope that ultimately I will outlast it. In a pandemic, well, medicine might defeat a microbe. It is hope that is the ultimate remedy. Not a hope that is based on wishful thinking, but one that is based on attention and reflection. That is how Camus sees it in one of the final passages of his book. It could be said, he writes, that once the faintest stirring of hope became possible, the dominion of the plague was ended. As we leave this sacred virtual space and we return to a world still beset by plague, let us remember that we are not alone. Through the ages, plagues have been a part of the interdependent web of the human condition. They connect us to people who have come before and to people who will come after. Let us learn from the ways in which they survived and the meanings they made, that we may make our own meanings. In that way, we may not only survive, but thrive. In the new world that's coming, the new world that we will help to create after the plague. <laughs>